Atheist Nomads episode 88, Seal NATO with Sam, Paul, and Rich. News for April 2nd, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and for the first time ever, joining me in person is Wesley. How's it going? And we are actually recording from Ask an Atheist Studios in Tacoma, Washington, and Sam Mulvey is with us. Hello! Hi! I'm not in charge! <laughs> we also have Paul from Corona, find me. I know, folks. And we have Rich Lyons from the kind of pod fa- fading living after faith. I'm laugh with me. Or at me, either one. <laughs> <laughs> which, if you guys haven't listened to the show, you really need to go back and check back all their past yeah. episodes, which I mean, are freaking amazing. There are some shows, like, I don't know, uh, one that's produced in this room, that kind of have a, a, a date on them. You know, they have an expiration date. They go they go rotten. Like, uh, y- you don't want to hear me talk about the president, uh, presidential election from 2012. That's old news. Um, living after faith, I, I still... You know, there may not have been a, a recent episode, uh, an episode recently, but at, those are just stories. They are completely timeless. They're they're timeless stories that are that form the core of why people make the decisions they do to enter into this community. And so, yeah, yeah I, like I said, I flog your show anytime I can. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> appreciate it. And and we may be back at some point, and uh, we may be at the place that uh, we've done all we can do, but we have left. Uh, that was our goal, to tell some stories and to let people understand they're not the only ones. And uh, with 72 episodes out there, I think, uh, I don't know, when the, if the fire gets back in my belly, we'll probably do it again. But uh, right now, we don't have a studio, and uh, uh, keeping up with life is kind of more important than keeping up with a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody on this show has been on the show at least one time before. In the case of Sam, it's already been twice. So this is a clip show is what you're saying. Uh, no, no, it is not. Uh, it's just kind of, it's, this is one of those awesome opportunities. Um, you know, I, I came up to the, the Seattle area for, uh, Lauren to be able to go to, uh, Emerald City Comic Con. I went ahead and drove and have been spending the day hanging out and drinking beer while she's geeking out. Well, okay. She's geeking out with Comic Con. I'm geeking out with other podcasters. And that's, that's an awesome, awesome thing to be able to do. <laughs> I live in Boise, Idaho. I know of one other podcaster in Boise, Idaho. And yeah, so this is, uh, this is pretty cool. And, uh, also be able to record face to face with people that I have recorded with before. You know, not only have Sam and, uh, and Paul been on the show before and Wesley and I have recorded many, many times before. Perhaps too many. And Rich has been our show. I've been on Rich's show. Yeah. I interviewed Rich on Chariots of Iron. Right. Uh, yeah. We're actually now all face to face. And this is, this is with microphones. <laughs> this is, this is like awesome. This is dangerous. <laughs> Just a little incestuous, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> oh, the, the, now, beer, the beer is the dangerous part, but. <laughs> yes, yes. We, we got started drinking before we hit the record button, which is, yeah, that might be a little bit dangerous. Yeah. And the incestuous part comes, well, later. <laughs> yeah. Later. I'm going to scoot my chair away from you, Wes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and when he says scooting his chair away from me, that he's actually sitting on my lap, so take that for what you will. And now he's moving towards me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Or it's behind you. (laughs) Entrance in rear, is that what you're saying? (laughs) Now, one thing that having this many people on the show, because generally speaking for a news episode, we made the mistake early on with Sam and then with uh, Eli and Lamar from Chariots of Iron of having the guest on for the news. Mm. And that was when we were doing news then interview. And it just goes so long. We, we spend an hour or more going over the news articles we talk about when it's just the two of us. Oh. 
We have five people in the room right now. So if you're expecting a news episode, sorry, fuck that. There will be news stories. (laughs) There just won't be much. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we do. Would you like to uh, to to give that advisory as a a concerned parent and as a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community? I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> Penis. <laughs> oh, wait, yeah. So, so, so this just goes out on the internet, right? Oh, yeah. Fuck, 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 fuck. Shut the fuck up, Sam. <laughs> You've been waiting a decade to do that. Oh, my God. Well, actually, with my podcast, our most popular episode is called Too Fucked Up to Fuck. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, God, yes. oh, that's gonna be somebody's ringtone, isn't it? <laughs> and actually the second episode you had that was focused solely almost exclusively on sex was when I came on. Yeah, that is right. Yes. We talked about Phrasing. that extensively, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> And a lot of our episodes do, but yeah, that was uh, we found some connection in that. Yeah, so if if you want to hear about how Rich was too fucked up, uh, too fucked up to fuck, and about some of these sexual issues I had back in the day, um, yeah, check out the Living After Faith uh, archives. Paul was on recently. Uh, you can go back and you can find him, or you can just go to the Corona Find Me podcast. And Sam is on Ask an Atheist. You can find him at Ask an Atheist dot. TV, because we were a TV show for like 10 minutes. And on uh, what radio station and time are you on? We are on WPRR in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We are on KKNW in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we were on in Olympia. I don't think we are anymore. Uh, the dance of the radio stations continues. So Very nice. And also, by the time this airs, I will have been on... Ask an atheist. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and that that'll be new, right? Because I have never been on. You've been here. Uh, you, you've been here a couple times, and it's like, hey, can you be on the show? No, I got to leave Sunday. Crap. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but now, now we're doing things a little bit differently, so it's easier to accommodate. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and uh, you know, by the time it's actually airing, I will be like crossing Suquamish Pass on my way back to Boise. So yeah, well, that will be interesting. It's but... winter, so it's kind of terrifying. But I, I really, <laughs> I really like. Snow call me pass. I like going up that way. I also like the fact that it's I ninety because I grew up on I ninety, and oh. where I grew up on I ninety, it's flat. Like there is nothing. <laughs> it it is you could you could, um, you could do a very straight thing. I don't know. It's, it just it just goes on forever. It's the Kennedy, um, but it's in Illinois, so the highest mountain is like four feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Becky uh, from Boston also grew up on I ninety. So it's like the. Yeah. The huge, totally. I've huge been on both ends of that. Walk off road. Yeah. I've been yeah. on the Massachusetts side and the Seattle side, and it's kind of weird because. Which made it a thing. Like when I first moved up here in 2000, well, it was a few years after I moved up here in 2010, but I still hadn't really coped with the idea that I now live in somewhere where there is winter because I lived in Arizona for seven years beforehand. I go, hey, I want to go with. Uh, I want to go home. I want to drive. I want to go to Chicago, and it's one road. I mean, the directions are easy, right? I mean, yeah, maybe February, but whatever. It's not going to be a big deal. I drove from here to Chicago in February. I got stuck in Presho, South Dakota, <laughs> for three days, including my birthday. <laughs> uh yeah. So, <laughs> I ninety fun. Oh, I also pissed on my own face for the first time. Ooh, well, a really stiff wind there. Uh, yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. All right. Also, it wasn't on purpose. Okay. It was the wind that was stiff. Okay, as an <laughs> yeah, as the wind. Well, when it's that cold, it's not just the wind, but mm, <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> All right, we do not have any uh, this day in history since we are horribly underprepared. No, totally. <laughs> but <laughs> there is no prep. Uh, so we do have science. So yes. it is now time for science and technology. And I am going to be silencing my phone now. <laughs> <laughs> First up is killer seals have developed a taste for shark guts. Scientists in Cape Town, South Africa, they have been uh, following up with some footage from a dive boat operator in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and they have found a Cape fur seal chasing, tossing, and killing a blue shark. He had seen this decades ago, finally saw it again, and it actually happened in times. A young male Cape fur seal actually killed and ate the guts of 10 sharks. What's interesting here, only the guts. The 
seal would disembowel the shark yeah. and leave the rest of the carcass to rot. I was going to ask about that because when you say guts, that's very specific. I mean, we're in we're in haggis territory, right? That's yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> this is like Jaws in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they need to do a new, a new version of Jaws that seals. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't know what you would have sticking up out of the water the same oh, way. Man, there are so many cliches that fit with this one. There's that. This is like the the C version of man bites dog. Yeah, it's been well documented. Sharks eating seals for a long time. Seals are eating sharks. So instead of Sharknado four, we're going to get Seal NATO. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for for a little bit more detail on the story, though, uh, the the seals and blue sharks are actually roughly the same size. They have roughly the same prey and usually leave each other alone. Typically speaking, if you are a predator, you don't eat something that has as good of a chance of killing you as you have of killing it. It's like a human isn't going to be wrestling a wolf, bear, or lion for a meal. Why? <laughs> well, they did it in Elizabethan England. I mean, that was what bear baiting was. But that was, you know, that was a sporting league. Yes, that wasn't for, for meals. That was no. to, to well, prove... Well, you were fed. Yes, yeah. But you weren't eating the bear. <laughs> they, 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 the goal was was uh, to prove their manliness. Yeah. Uh, because they could no longer get away with killing other human beings of lower socioeconomic class, but... Could hmm. the seal be protecting his food source by uh, killing and disembowel? I mean, you got to admit, the, the sharks aren't going to be, or at least might be a little dis, uh, dissuaded from trying to eat what the seal's eating when he sees, you know, 10 of his cousins there with their guts hanging out. I think that the seal is eating the bits that the shark already ate that the seal wants. Oh, that too. <laughs> uh, the, well, Rich, along the lines of what you were saying, it's not trying to drive away other sharks. Sharks are stupid. Oh. Yeah. Their their brains are not very highly evolved is the wrong word, even though it's overly used, but it's not very highly developed. I think that might be a little bit more accurate. It is deeply specialized. Yes. Yeah. To find and kill food. Uh they don't have a lot of critical thinking skills. Uh the seal, on the other hand not good at poetry. <laughs> <laughs> the seal, though, by killing the sharks, is killing competition. And if you kill the car- competition for your food, you do get more access to food. What do seals eat? Fish. Just fish? So is this... Is this uh, so there's two things that occur to me here. Maybe you're right. Maybe the, the hot guts eating is just out of spite. Like, screw you, shark! I'm going to eat your guts! I'm going to eat your hot guts! Or perhaps this is seals discovering the burrito. <laughs> Because there's a stomach full of fish, so you get through the shark's hot guts, which you guys were talking about. Maybe they were going after the food he likes. And then there's there's a, a fishy center. So maybe it's a shark fish burrito. The seals are yeah. discovering cuisine. Yeah. Or, yeah. or actually, a little bit more apt analogy, if they're going for the intestines more, would be the sausage. Yes. Yes, it would be. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> they make it where I'm from. <laughs> Is this where I slip the penis in, Wes? <laughs> that comes a little bit later. later. <laughs> That's when the incest starts. No, <laughs> there will be no incest. None of us are related, and there will be no sexual activity. Bit of a sausage fest up here, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you brought it up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> a, uh, a team looking at the uh, some, some data from the sample analysis at Mars instrument on the NASA Curiosity rover have found nitrogen on the surface of Mars, and this was released by heating Martian sediments. This was in the form of nitric oxide. What the hell? Nitrous oxide. Laughing gas. Laughing gas? (laughs) (laughs) We must go to Mars. And it could be caused by the breakdown of nitrates. So little tiny creatures, possibly? Possibly. I've made sure there's possibly in there. Uh, this this does at least add evidence uh, that ancient Mars was once habitable. Not necessarily that it was habited, but at least habitable. Because the uh, presence of water, presence of nitrogen, presence of... Is there oxygen in the air there? I think there is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, most of it is, is trapped with some carbon. And there's a lot of carbon in the soil and there's CO2. Yeah, that's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Um, that's it. We know it. You're good to go. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Can I, I, to be honest with you, um, I'm getting a little sick of these stories. (laughs) 
I am. I'm just waiting for the rover to find the, you know, the giant glacier in the cave with a very large contraption above it with three-fingered control panel. And the reason I'm sick of these stories is because I suck at science. Because, I mean, these rovers are awesome. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. But I'm getting sick of, of, of uh, space news being, uh, we discovered another possibly damp rock. It may have been damp 600 years ago. Oh, look, another damp rock. Oh, look, there's another, there's another uh, hydrogen compound. There's another compound. There may have been methane. Like, there's all of these stories, but there are so many caveats and so much that remains to be, to be discovered that I just, when I see these stories, I get excited. I do. I get excited, but then I go, fuck, can we just go there and figure this shit out already? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that everything just keeps on adding up. It's a little puzzle, man. It's, yeah. it, it's a mystery, and, and that's they what I mean keep by, on taking little chunks. And that's what I mean by I suck at science because honestly, that is what is happening now is the scientific method. That is how this shit happens. I just want to be like five years from now and like, yeah. oh yeah, looking back, there's all that shit. Uh, actually, yeah. five, five to ten years, which sure, sure. in scientific speak means never, never. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when is fusion power going to happen? Fifty years from whenever you're asking the question. Yeah, the the this this whole Mars thing, we keep on finding evidence that Mars could have life. That should not really be surprising. It's from the same solar system. It's the same part of the solar system. So it was coming from the same part of the accretion disk that formed our uh, everything in the solar system. It was probably bombarded by many of the same asteroids and comets that Earth was. Not only that, but we have evidence that both Earth and been and Mars have been bombarded by asteroids that came from Earth and Mars yeah. from earlier impacts. So there is there is a panspermia argument to be made here. Potentially, we have never to date found evidence of life on Mars. All we're finding is that life is possible, but potentially if life was possible in our solar system, it should be possible just about anywhere in the solar system with the right temperature range. Mars isn't all that interesting to me in this topic. It's some of the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah. So that have the correct temperatures. Titan, Europa, Enceladus, those those guys. Ganymede, yeah. Ganymede, yeah. Well, yeah. One of those recently they discovered uh, methane, if I'm mm-hmm. and where I'm from it, I'm not really a scientist. I'm kind of, you know, as Sam had mentioned, but where there's farts, there's life. And methane (laughs) is farts. So, I mean, if you've proved, I mean, that to me, that's all the proof I need that there's life on those planets. methane can be produced from non-organic processes. We've also found methane on Mars. It is possible non-organically. Okay, it's an organic molecule, so that's not the right word. It can be caused from something other than metabolism from a living organism uh but it is usually on earth our only real data point on what causes methane is cows it comes from (laughs) living things eating things and farting yeah yeah so we don't know for sure it could be i'm just excited because any progress towards life outside of Earth is really going to fuck with the Dominionists, and that is <laughs> that is positive news for me. Is it? Is it? Or are they just going to become space Romans and say, Ooh, "Oh, we yeah. must, we must bring Jesus to the Martian amoeba"? <laughs> I mean, that, that's where this could go. Well, it's Pat true. Robertson has already said if there are aliens, they're going to hell anyway. So that, that's already been discovered, <laughs> and that we've already doctrinally already. dealt with it. Yeah, yeah, the Catholics are already saying that you know, bring the aliens to us, and we'll convert them. And I, you know, far be it for me to say something nice about C.S. Lewis, but I did like the idea that C.S. Lewis had, which was for every civilization, a Jesus. Like they yeah. have their own Jesus. Yeah, that Jesus exists in every civilization throughout yeah. the universe. Yep. Yeah, which is practically a, uh, what's that guy from, from Astounding? I don't know, the guy who does the cycle of the hero thing. I mean, it's practically, it's just, it's a relabeled cycle of the hero. Now, Adventists had a very different take on it than that. It was that... There is life on other worlds around the universe, uh, not in our solar system, but elsewhere. And every planet had a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And only humans, the only ones made in the image of God, fucked up. (laughs) What does that say about God when uh, (laughs) the only ones created in his image were the ones that, yeah. And also the word self-hating was in the dictionary. I think we just found the picture. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bleak. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, next we have, keeping on the topic of life, uh, there a group from the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in the UK have been working on the problem of abiogenesis. And in a paper they published, uh, they described how they could create uh, amino acids from common elements that would have been found in the primordial soup with ultraviolet radiation, sunlight. These are very important. Okay, it, they, they were able to create two and three carbon sugars, amino acids, uh, ribonucleotides, and glycerol. These are all things that you need for metabolism and creating proteins. It's not finding out how life necessarily formed, even though that's what the headlines are saying. Um, but they did find and were able to demonstrate recreating it in a lab some of those early steps that would have been necessary. Nice. So you're able to like take all those particles and bombard them with slightly greasy solar particles, and there you go. So is this based off of the uh, Miller-Ure uh, experiment? Yuri? Array? I don't know. The Miller experiments is how I was wondering, is the guy who, in the '60s who shot up some dirty water with uh, with electricity to see if it would create amino acids, and then the 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 study was uh, you know was found to be lacking in certain areas, or actually didn't have the primordial uh, chemical makeup exactly right. I, I, is there a relationship between this and that, or because this because it sounds very familiar to the to the Miller experiments to me? This this is building upon all of that. Okay. Uh, and it also, they, they are, they're looking at, because there's a lot of people trying to find this, a lot of chemists, uh, biomolecular chemists are trying to work on this problem because that is a pretty big gaping hole. It's one of the few areas where a God of the gaps is actually almost reasonable. That might be a bridge far. I said almost reasonable. Okay. All right. You, a, a God of the gaps there is defensible because we can't say no it was definitely natural but there is no reason to think that it was not natural since yeah. everything else we haven't been able to understand has been proven to have been natural um, but it is one of those few areas that is completely in the the unknown range uh, everybody has kind of settled into three camps rna first so rna is a lot simpler and it's easier to form so the rna then codes dna and then you have life. Uh, there is the life first started on another world and then came to Earth. Which would be Mars is a lot of the current thought. Mars, a asteroid, comet, somewhere. Uh, and then there's the, the third option of it just developed with DNA first here on Earth. Uh, this particular study, they're finding that it could have kind of been all three. Uh, comets brought in some of the materials needed to form this, and then it formed here on Earth with amino acids that then formed RNA that then formed DNA, uh, while at the same time also proving each one kind of wrong. Right. I mean, that's the thing, is we're just kind of assuming that life happening on being created on Earth was a single event. And I think, I, honestly, if, I think we, in, in, honestly, I think that's a little bit of psych, psychology that we inherited from religion. We're just assuming it happened once. What if it happened a bunch of times? What if it happened a bunch of different ways? Yeah. You, okay, yeah, you're going for, like, the prime mover, like, that there was just one single uh, thing that happened. And, so, yeah, there, I can totally there, see that it could have been a... Yeah, you a have group. this conceptualization that uh, Shaft came down from the heavens pointed and then there was life and then went back to the heavens so i'm right all, all we've done is just take shaft out of it and now life just happened in one event and everything that we think of came from that single event that's what i'm talking about is i think the idea of life happening on earth as a single event is a vestigial organ of our religious beginnings of natural philosophy Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> well stated, Mr. Moley. Now, they, what they, they did, though, prove that it was possible for life to originate here. Yeah. Uh, to, to go into a little bit more detail of what they found, it was earlier meteorites would be carrying some of the ingredients that when reacting with nitrogen in the atmosphere, it would produce hydrogen cyanide. This would then dissolve in water, then be exposed to ultraviolet light and form these molecules. So some of it's what's already in the atmosphere. Some's coming down from higher up. 
Uh, now, those same processes could have happened elsewhere just as easily. We also don't know if life happened here once or more than once. That's true. If life happened, abiogenesis could have happened and that first attempt fail. And then five different unique forms of life all popped up at once and one killed and ate all of them. <laughs> and we des descended from the winner. That is just as likely as it not even being possible to happen here and coming from, from Mars. So the ecological asshole hypothesis, I think. What am I calling that? That's actually kind of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a little bit of a fuck you religious people who say it's not possible that life could have happened on its own here. No, it fucking could have happened a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. The th and see, you were saying the, the plausibility of the God of the gaps. I don't think we have to prove how it happened. I think we just have to identify that it could have happened, mm -hmm. that the elements, the, the necessary, I say elements, I'm not talking chemical elements, the necessary ingredients, let me use that, the necessary ingredients obviously were in place. And over billions of years, it could have happened. We... That way, you're at least on even par with your God of the gaps. So you still land on the place of prove to me your God. So even though we can't scientifically at this point say this is absolutely how it happened, if we can just chemically demonstrate, and it sounds like they have, that it could have happened, then you really have kind of kicked the God of the gap off. Because at that point, it doesn't really take a God. Even if you're saying, you know, we can't nail down how it did happen, the fact that we're, we can prove that it could have happened, mm -hmm. we really have closed the gap on that. You know, at that point, there's speculation, and, and you have in my opinion, at least, remove the gap. Well, and most people with a God of the Gaps, they're using that to bolster claims that are not justified by a God of the Gaps. Right. Because realistically, right now, at most, you need a God for the Big Bang and starting life. That's not Jesus. That is not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or any fucking religion that's not some spiritual being that is touching your heart and making you a f crazy gluten intolerant vegan <laughs> it's it's this in inhumane thing that just poof wait around for 10 billion years poof wait around for four and a half billion years doing what jerking off that's what i'd be doing <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 That's da, what da. he is doing, <laughs> listeners. No, not in here. Look at all the porous surfaces. That would be really hard to clean up. Preferably not with a UV light. There is not an, there is not enough bleach in the world for this. No, no. <laughs> and it probably harm some of the sound dampening qualities of, of the foam. Well, yeah, because, you know, as the proteins encrust, they would create a hard surface for sound waves to revert off of. <laughs> oh, I am um, horrible Mr. Wizard. Come um, to my show. <laughs> but at least you have the window closed so the light won't come in and cause the proteins to become a life form. That... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, all right, I think that's that wraps it up for science. Uh, <laughs> We've solved science, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, science is pretty much finished when we're finished with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the point where we have been trying to put put in promos for other shows, you know, tit for tat. Um, but we've run out of, of promos, so uh, we we have already plugged uh, Living After Faith. Go check that out. Uh, Rich, where can people find... Livingafterfaith.com. Uh, go to that, and it'll forward you to livingafterfaith.blogspot.com. Uh, and you can look us up on Facebook at Living After Faith. Uh, Twitter at uh, Laugh With Me. All righty. And now it's time for politics and religion. Oh. First off, we have Phil Robertson. That is Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, that was Wesley, by the way. <laughs> that is all rich. Phil Robertson uh, has some hypothesis while he was uh, speaking to a group of, of 
good, wholesome Christians. I, I, I don't know. This conscience thing, I mean, we just, we just dreamed it up. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's no good. There's no evil. I'll make a bet with you. Two guys break into an atheist home. He has a little atheist wife and two little atheist daughters. Two guys break into his home and tie him up in a chair and gag him. And then they take his two daughters in front of him and rape both of them and then shoot them. And they take his wife and decapitate her head off in front of him. And then they can look at him and say, isn't it great to not have to worry about being judged? Isn't it great that there's nothing wrong with this? There's no right or wrong. Now is it, dude? And then you take a sharp knife and take his manhood and hold it in front of him and say, wouldn't it be something if this was something wrong with this? But you're the one that says there's no God, there's no right, there's no wrong. So we're just having fun. We're sick in the head. Have a nice day. If it happened to them, they probably would say something about this. It just ain't right. Motherfucker. <laughs> if there's something sick and not right in the head, it's you. Duck, <laughs> duck dynasty motherfuck. The thing is, no atheist that I know of is saying there's no right, no wrong, no good, no bad. I mean, for, uh, I've never, I mean, harming another individual is wrong. I, I have often said on the show, and I must say it again, I don't believe in evil. I don't think evil is a concept. Uh, I think wrong is a concept. I think tragic is a concept. I think harm is a concept. And wow, all of that is, uh, all of that is available if you watch an episode of Duck Dynasty, let alone what the, the fucker says. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, evil is a, evil is a magical concept. It's it's magical thinking, and so I don't I don't really go in for it. Every atheist I have met is a humanist or utilitarian, or has some other ethical principle, or at least just wants to live in society. Or, and I haven't met any of these, fortunately. They're in prison because they don't belong in society. <laughs> Phil Robertson would be that kind of atheist, yeah, mm -hmm. who would need to go to prison. Apparently. To be a almost decent human being, because he is not a decent human being, he needs to believe there is somebody up in, in the sky that would punish him forever, forever, for raping and killing someone's family. He's fantasizing about stuff that is, at least for me, impossible to really even, even think about. It's some really twisted shit. I don't know about y'all, but I consider myself a secular humanist with hedonistic tendencies. Uh, basically, <laughs> that's the best thing I've heard all day. <laughs> I do whatever feels good, so long as it doesn't adversely affect other people. And you know what? Helping people feels good a lot of the time, too. So that's what I call myself. That's what I think. But this guy's just got some fucking screws loose. Well, and let's just, not even if, if you're, you're a humanist, if you look at, okay, he believes that atheists have no right or wrong because we don't have a god. We all live in a society, and everyone in a, in a society subscribes to a social contract. You don't kill your neighbor, and your neighbor doesn't kill you. If you break that contract, there are consequences. It's not like Phil Robertson says, there's no consequences, because if you rape and kill someone's family and cut off his dick, you're going to go to prison, or if you're in a state like Phil Robertson would want you to be in, you're going to get executed. There are consequences. Here and now. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't need a God to provide consequences. We, the, the, the people, we in the society provide consequences. We provide standards. And that is more than enough for almost everyone to do the right thing. But his value statement isn't the here and the now, like Wesley was saying. It's the eternal the here and the now is temporal, is temporary. There's no value to that. The value is the hereafter, and that's where he's placing this 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 eternal principle. The here and now doesn't count for anything, right? Well, well he's expecting the here and now. He's talking. Uh whether he means it or not, he's speaking of an interventionist god. Mm -hmm. And so this is really easy to turn on his head and say, yeah, that whole Hitler guy. Uh, yeah, God didn't come down and kill him. That means Hitler was okay. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the logical flip of that 
absolutely ridiculous argument. That, or that Hitler asked for forgiveness at the last second and got okayed and got a pass anyways. And I totally went Godwin and fuck you. Or, <laughs> or that Hitler is burning in hell and getting his now. Right, but that's it. Is is um you know, he's he's scheduling it like like it's a it's a hereafter thing. But he's expecting the way he's talking about it is that it, it, ta- it sounds like we should expect when a, when our family is attacked in front of our eyes, some sort of divine intervention. That's the that's the model. That's the unstated part of this model. I think there's a lot. All of the really horrible shit about that quote is unsaid. The least terrifying part mm-hmm. of that statement is what you heard. Mm-hmm. The thoughts behind it, the psychology that leads to that. That's the terrifying thing. I have this huge. Ugh. Once upon a time, I am also president of Humanists of Washington. I am a secular humanist. Uh, we hosted a debate uh, between Bob Seidensticker, who's who's just a badass, and uh, Rand something. I don't know. <laughs> he was uh, some some preacher guy, and it was a debate about the value of God or whatever. And I got into a conversation with him afterwards. And this is a bit of a story. Feel free to cut this out. Um, <laughs> uh and and he came up to me and he did the well you're an atheist therefore you have no morality and I'm like blah 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 wait 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 morality is an emergent thing I don't like being murdered you don't like being murdered I don't remember a population of people in history who thought being murdered was fun like there's like when you have a group of people when you have a society when you have a population you've heard this argument before and then he immediately goes to well what if somebody murdered your wife. Why do they always go there? What I'm asking for, what my, my major question is, I've not seen the video of this. Was he behind a lectern when he was saying this, or was he just on stage? Mm, because if we could get a zoom in on the front of his rotten fucking hip waders to see if there's any adjustment in the gonads, I think he's getting off on this, and it drives me nuts. This is a power fantasy, mm-hmm. and it's terrible. And the fact that the fact that he's able to have this misogynist, horrible, fuck off power fantasy, and he's got a cheering section, drives me up the fucking wall. Yeah, he got applause at the end yeah, of this. Yeah, oh, yeah, they cut that part out, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's to to me? What's the the most disturbing thing? And like like you brought up the the here and now to all of us, the here and now is what matters. Right. So our family getting brutalized matters what he's saying and he's while he's trying to say it doesn't matter to us what he's really letting on to is that he doesn't think the here and now really matters and i want to kind of pick up with that because that's exactly right as a, a former pastor for 20 years i actually preached from the pulpit the only thing that matters in this life is making sure that you're right in the next life mm-hmm. And whatever it takes, whatever sacrifice I have to make, whatever way I have to live, whatever I have to do, all that matters in this life is being right for the next life. And I think uh, on a larger scale, that's one of the most insidious things about Christianity and religion itself is that it teaches there is no value for this life. The only value there is is in the pie in the sky. And for people who come out of that for me specifically it's very difficult often for me to be in the present because my whole life was geared from Mm -hmm. looking back at it from the great here by and by not living in the moment and knowing that this is what matters i think that's one of the most insidious things about religion Mm -hmm. you're saying this was basically just a practice run this life for the religious people well just a a shakedown cruise more like it just kind of you know let's uh, make sure nothing blows up during warranty i mean all that matters is that you made the right decision to believe in the right god and then uh you're okay so that's the only thing that matters in this life and and if you think about it if they were right that would be the true case because you live 70 years here 100 years let's say you live 400 years here that still wouldn't compare to trillions of millennia of eternity so when do you want to have your fun you know so if their concept of eternal life was true he would actually be right and that's what's so fucking dangerous Mm -hmm. but he's still an asshole yes oh yeah (laughs) Uh, this is uh this becomes most clear to me when we start talking about environmentalism and just sort of the uh ecological phobia that christians seem to have because it means focusing on 
the real world rather than on some sort of space world. It becomes all about that one word, dominion, that you're giving dominion <laughs> over the birds, the beasts, and all yeah. that. And they just say, fuck it, let's use it. And when it's gone, well, we'll be dead or Jesus will be coming. And yet they're, they're missing the verse at the end of the Bible that was on the engineering building at my college, Walla Walla, now university, uh, that says, hurt not the earth or the water or the sky. That we should take care of the earth that we're on. That's even, that's in Revelation, the most fucked up book in the Bible. But boy, do they like to quote from it. (laughs) (laughs) And they quote from it and they forget the part that says, don't fuck up this planet. You know, the Christian perspective that I was taught and and that I actually preached was, we've read how it's all going to end in the book of Revelation. We know how it's all going to end. We know that the world doesn't you know, that we don't econo- or, or ecologically destroy our own planet. We know God's going to destroy mm-hmm. it and then re- rebuild it. So all these scientists have to be wrong because the Bible's already told us how it's going to end. Now, actually, when I was still a believer and denied climate change, uh, I had a, 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 a few times the thought that, well, if it is happening, God said he's going to destroy the earth with fire. It's just already starting. The earth's warming up. We're getting ready for the fire and brimstone. Exactly. And I've seen, you know, uh, so many things where that, you know, very concept of uh, everything is already determined, it creates a hopeless life. And, and if I hear anything in his words, uh, he sounds like he's pretty sick of being hopeless. Damn. It's almost it, we have to remember the perspective, though. This is we want to bring about that termination point. That termination point is our salvation. When we reach that, we've reached our culmination. We've reached what we've wanted to attain. In some twisted, fucked up way, we can actually celebrate watching the earth die. We can watch that mm-hmm. that fire by death because that means we're getting closer to that termination point. There's a whole lot of people that if a nuclear blast took out, you know, D.C. or whatever, they'd see a silver lining in that shit. Damn right. Oh, Adventists absolutely loved the Cold War. (laughs) It was like gravy for them. Uh, (laughs) The the most weird, twisted vegetarian gravy for them. (laughs) And because it had everything they needed. There was the good and the evil. The world was aligning into two sides. And... Everything was perfect for Armageddon. We were moments away for, what, 50 years from absolute annihilation happening. The Adventist evangelists, that entire time period, I think they were orgasmic every time they saw the news. And growing up in in the 90s, I was hearing, going to, to evangelistic series, where you could tell they were yearning for that. Because they were sure that Russia was still the bad guy. They were still going to be... World War III was right around the corner. They just couldn't let it go. Because when it's bad, it's a great time to be a believer. Uh, let, let's say... But that, that is a good segue to our next story. I want to say fucking faith vampires. <laughs> uh, anyways. I want to put a smile on every Southern Baptist's uh, face out there. Um... In the news, Ted Cruz, the the good Southern Baptist, did any of you know that he actually married a uh, Adventist lady? It was kind of crazy. Yeah, Miss Cruz, she's a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, Miss Heidi Cruz, 42-year-old, uh, very rich family, used to work for Goldman Sachs. Man, yeah. mon- money all around. Her, her parents were, were doctor or dentist. Uh, her... Uh Grandparents were doctors, lots of, of time in her family in the, the mission field, short-term missions for the most part. Her brother's a doctor. Uh, she is a graduate of Monterey Bay Academy in the Bay Area of California, an Adventist boarding school. Uh, her Adventist credentials are not too shabby. She's even taught her husband to not balk at vegetarian family Thanksgivings. Hell no. They, he should balk. No, fuck that. Well, especially considering so the fact furky. that only half of Adventists in the U.S. are vegetarian. 
So we're talking about Seventh Day Adventists. We're not yes. talking about uh, little calendars that you get chocolates out of every day leading up to Christmas. <laughs> Advent <laughs> calendar? Yeah, no. Okay. No. Seventh Day Adventists. All right. Adventists, not Advent. Adventists. Yeah, okay. I just want to say that everybody knows a good gravy starts with some bacon grease. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're vegetarians. Half of American Adventists are. Okay. Almost nobody in the rest of the world in the Adventist church is vegetarian. What's the justification for that? For a vegetarian? Yeah. Uh, going back to an Eden-like diet of plants and vegetables. There that's are fruits and vegetables. kind of sane. That's, that's like way saner than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was, okay. It's, it's uh, <laughs> the, 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 the basic rule is you stay away from the unkosher meats, but not keeping kosher. Right. So you don't care if there's blood in the meat and you don't care about mixing like meat and dairy, but you stay away from... From your, uh, your your pork and your sell- shellfish, uh, it actually is much closer to halal, and yeah, that's so that's a basic standard. And then the good Adventists are vegetarian, so Adventists especially like their pastors to be vegetarian. And the the awesome thing here, Cruz is at least enough of an Adventist to uh, Mrs. Cruz enough of an Adventist to be vegetarian. She married a Baptist. All about the hamburgers, I'm sure. Adventists are not supposed to marry outside of the Adventist church. That's actually something that can get you thrown out of the Adventist church. Just like eating bacon or drinking beer. Just like the Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, he could, you know, get kicked out for the same thing. Kind of very in-group, out-group there. There's a lot of religious groups that are that way. And it tends not to be a problem as long as you're recruiting new members. It is a problem if you're, say, the Zoroastrians, and you don't recruit, you don't do any proselytizing, you don't marry outside of the group, and you're isolated for 2,500 years. And eventually all you leave behind is really good furniture. Yeah. They're down, to, they're down to like 600,000 people. But, you know, Adventists, they're, they're growing. They're bringing people in. She, she can't be a good Adventist if she... While an Adventist married a Southern Baptist. Baptists are almost as bad as the Catholics. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the other hand, (laughs) married to a politician of national prominence. When power enters into the equation, many things are automatically forgiven. And I wonder if that's what's happening here. Kind of like them being on Obamacare. Yeah. (laughs) Now, when they got married... There wasn't national prominence. Mm-hmm. They were both just staffers on George W. Bush's campaign. Okay. First time around. So they were pretty low level. So there's the Jehovah's Witnesses, there's the Seventh day Adventists, and Rich, I think you might have some stuff to say on it. Because with the way you would talk about your time among the Pentecostals, it was like one of like the Seventh day Adventists or whatever, but it was just your church. It was just the people in the room. Right. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> that are going to be saved? I how? I mean, that's totally common. Yeah, I like yeah. Southern Everyone Baptists. Have like eight people in it. The Southern Baptists. I mean, it doesn't matter what church you go to. If you go to that church, you know that's the only church that's getting saved. All the other ones got the shit wrong. See that with mo- that's the reason there are thirty thousand plus denominations of Christianity. They all think they're the one that's got it right. And in the Pentecostal Church, we. Uh, we did uh, what I call we hit our crazy. We would say we don't believe that we're the only ones going to heaven. We believe everyone who obeys the true doctrine of Christ will go to heaven. But we had the true doctrine of Christ, so <laughs> you know. So we we wouldn't say all of those people are going to hell. We would just say that only those who obey the way we believe it are going. You know. So I guess the. I guess that's a common part of religious sects, more so the ones that are considered sects than, say, denominations, which, you know, you have Methodists that think ever, you know, the Catholics are saved and the Episcopalians are saved and the Episcopalians think everybody's saved and all that. But then when you get out to the fringe groups like the Adventists, the uh, Pentecostals, those kind of groups, yeah, there's very strong my four and no more. And... Where I really found the the bizarre nature of that is like in your own family, 
You know, you go from your church service to go eat with your family, and of course, all of them are going to hell. But you don't really want to, you know, sit there at the dinner table and, you know. But some do. It's, it's just, yeah, you're right. It is bizarre, Sam. <laughs> Adventists actually have a really liberal view on who's saved. It's based on how you respond to the light that you're given. So if all you know is the Baptist church and you're a good Baptist, then God will forgive the rest. If all you know is Muslim, the Muslim faith, and you're a good Muslim, then you will be saved. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have even ever heard of Jesus until the time of probation is closed. And at that point, everybody is, well, fucked. But we aren't there yet in their belief. So is there some sort of per- celestial parole officer happening here? What, I don't. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Actually, that part's a, a kind of weird to wrap your mind around. Uh, 1844, uh, Jesus was supposed to return. The The prophecy they were thinking was it was uh, the lamb returning to the sanctuary to cleanse it. Um, they believed that sanctuary was the earth. Jesus didn't come. So he must be cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. So right now, and since October 22, 1844, Jesus has been in heaven going over the book, seeing who's been good, who's been bad, who's asked for forgiveness, who he wants to forgive, and judging everyone. And once he's done judging everybody, once everybody currently alive has had an opportunity to either accept or reject him, for the record, I reject him, uh, then probation will be closed, and wherever you stand at that point, it's a done deal. Celestial Santa Claus and Krampus. Yeah, all wrapped up in one. All right. That goes for most religions, but I like it. (laughs) This is one of those things that is so common in American religion, is the idea that I have the one truth everybody else will burn, and I'm okay with that. It's so common in America, and I have never been able to wrap my head around it. I just, I just can't. It's, it's, it's such a, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to totally have an eternal barbecue with uh, Jesus up in heaven. Uh, and a barbecue sounds better than what they actually describe heaven to be, but I'm just going with my own thing. Um, and then just, yeah, everybody, everybody I see every day at the guy I buy a newspaper from the guy I buy a soda from, uh, my coworkers, my boss, some of my children, they're all going to burn forever. And I'm okay with that. I, I've never understood that. I've never been able to wrap my head around it. I would say most people who actually think they believe that really don't. I was a true That's believer, a and you, you're familiar with my oh, yeah. situation. Uh, I post traumatic stress. You know, I've heard people say, if anyone really believed that, it'd make you crazy. Hi. I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. It made me crazy. I have a brain that's broken, and uh, I deal with uh, mental illness every goddamn day, every fucking minute. And I agree with what you're saying there, Sam. it's, It's so bizarre that I really think that most people who say they believe that, they may even think they believe it. But when it comes down to it, I really don't think... That you can look at, I mean, without being permanently messed up, you can't look at the waiter who comes to your table, the, like you said, the mailman, the person who bring, you just can't be a normal person. And that's where, back to the story about the Duck Dynasty guy, that's the attitude that that belief, the true belief That's what he was echoing. That's what he was, you know, exactly projecting. And that's, I guess, a better word than echoing. That's what he was projecting is that exact belief that you're talking about is all of this doesn't matter. I'm right. The rest is wrong. And it doesn't matter. I don't think our society would work for very long if people actually believed all that shit. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Now, sticking with the Adventist theme. Uh, Sorry about that. (laughs) We've got another one. Uh, There is an article in the Adventist Review. This is the denominational publication for the world. The entire world church, it goes out to all 18 and a half million members. That is a number that people often don't think of. Adventists are those quiet little people that you think don't eat meat that probably do, that might have a hospital in your town that's a lot better than the Catholic hospital, although probably smaller. Um, And people tend to think for crazy religious groups, 
that Mormons are huge. No, no. Adventists have them beat. They have the Jehovah's Witnesses beat. They're the quiet little group of fundy crazies rising. Uh, with that in mind, this article in the Adventist Review, uh, the title of it is The Church Appears About to Fall. I really like that shock look on your face, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a trick. It's always a trick. <laughs> So I'm going I'm to read a little bit from this. Uh, has anyone else been concerned about the Adventist church? First of all, the closings. The academy our family enjoyed visiting a few months ago for a volleyball tournament. Mount Vernon Academy is about to close. And to break in here for a little bit, Mount Vernon Academy was the one Adventist boarding school that was actually started because the church's prophet said it needed to start. She was in Michigan at the time and said there needs to be a boarding school in Ohio. And so people went and they started that boarding school in Ohio. To be sure, this woman was batshit crazy, though. Yes. Okay. Brain damaged. Uh, yeah, she was She was bad. A brain damaged alcoholic, actually. Uh, wonderful combination. Anyway, so, so continuing on. Uh, the, the oldest boarding academy is still operating. Mount Vernon joins dozens of others that have dismissed its students for a final time. It's not easy seeing campuses that once burst with life go quiet. If struggling boarding academies can be explained, what about our colleges? Students are supposed to go off to college, so why aren't more going off to Adventist colleges? Of even more concern is the state of our institutions is the state of our hearts. In North America, too many of us are apathetic, secular. Sabbath schools are sparsely attended. Half of our members don't study scripture on their own. Worst of all is a troubling mindset that being correct about the Sabbath automatically means that we're spiritual. Does being right about your spouse's birthday mean that you're happily married? The Sabbath and everything else means nothing outside of the personal relationship with Christ. Really nothing. 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 Recently, one of the most well-known Adventists in the world is no longer an Adventist. Ryan Bell, a former Adventist minister in Hollywood, California, was once the poster pastor for the progressive Adventist movie in the heavily trafficked Spectrum blog. At the beginning of 2014, shortly after being asked to resign his position, Ryan announced a very public endeavor that he would go a year without God and then write a book about it. Early, this is a low point. Yeah. Uh, there, there, he goes on, and he does get into signs of hope. You would think the current member role of 18 million people worldwide would be a sign of hope, but academies are closing. And, and for these academies, to, to make them really under, uh, make sense, these are mostly boarding schools where kids are being sent off as young as 14. I went off to Milo Adventist Academy, um, at 16 and lived in dormitories and uh, didn't go home all that much uh, at 16 years old. And these schools have been getting less and less common as more and more people urbanize. Uh, a lot more of the smaller Adventist schools are becoming 12 grade schools. Uh, Adventist colleges aren't growing like they theoretically should be because people are going to Real colleges. I was going to say secular schools. They they are real <laughs> colleges. They teach <laughs> real they're, stuff. They're approved, but <clears throat> they are accredited institutions and often highly ranked. Uh, like my alma mater uh, is uh, actually one of the highest ranked masters institution levels institutions in the uh, Northwest. So they aren't all. Even though you said alma mater. Uh, alma mater. <laughs> God damn it! Dr drink your beer. Drink your beer. All right. Hey, Dustin, just for edification for the non Adventists in, Adventists in your audience. Ooh, class houses, my friend. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm going to try to phrase this correctly. Uh, myself included, mm -hmm. you, you keep emphasizing this role, the 18 million. Mm -hmm. What does it take to be on the role, though? Is that significant? Are there significant gates to meet? Yeah. Or is this simply a paper pushing exercise where it's not really eighteen million is the Scientologist claiming two million members worldwide? Right. Yeah, that's that's total crap. To get on the books, you actually have to, as a quote unquote adult, used to be twelve is the minimum age. It's now down eight nine is the minimum age. Um, get baptized. That usually requires studying with your pastor first, and. Make a profession of faith, uh, signing a baptismal vow, making public vows, and being voted into uh, membership of the church by the church in, in session there. Um, it's a, a democratic process, and they do periodically 
clean the books. If you die, you're removed from the books. If you resign your membership, it's usually no questions asked, you're removed from the books. If you stop coming, it might take 20 years, but you get removed from the books. <laughs> this differs from, say, the Mormons, who are also in the you know tens of millions, yeah. uh, you have 12, 13 million right now. They count you from the moment you are named in a Mormon church for 110 years. Or the Catholics who claim a billion, but uh, there's a lot of people who say that they've specifically told the church they're not members anymore, but they're still counted. Well, the Catholic Church doesn't have member roles. That's true. That's they true. like, for example, Bolivia is Catholic, so they count Bolivia mm-hmm. as Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost as bad. The Pentecostal Church, the way that uh, the group I was a part of, claims a membership of three million. But the way they get their membership is they take a uh, attendance on Easter Sunday, but they know that they're going to do this. So what you do is you have a play, you have a program, you invite everybody, mm-hmm. you have free food, you do all this kind of stuff, and you count up and you've got 110 people, so you round up to say 400, and <laughs> then you report that number, and that's how they get their three million. Well, when in actuality, that church that reported 400 averages mm-hmm. more in service around 30. Mm-hmm. Now, so Adventists yeah. do have, uh, with a very high, highly complex organizational structure, there is incentive to not overly inflate your numbers for too terribly long because they have this complex formula to determine whether or not you get a pastor or how many pastors you get. Um, so there are small churches form, mul- multiple of them are put in districts with one pastor over all of them, and larger churches will get multiple pastors. And it's a combination of members on the books, average attendance, and the amount of tithe money you have coming in. If your attendance and tithe is really low and your membership is really high, they're going to start yanking your pastors. And they're more likely to yank your pastors if your numbers are really out of whack than if your numbers actually are all in a spot that makes sense. Uh, so they, they do have, fortunately, incentive to to do that. Anyway, what's what's really heartening here? Leaders in what, one of the few growing churches left in the world is scared. That was the thing is is dying church. Like we could talk about the uh, Christian Scientists. Uh, nicest looking building in Tacoma is a uh, or whatever it tries to be all Roman um, where at this point it's a newspaper I mean I think there are more people employed by the Christian science monitor now than there are Christian scientists uh, which has always been a weird thing for me as somebody who grew up with shortwave and, and uh, you know and an interest in journalism the Christian science monitor it's this it's this newspaper and this radio station attached to this batshit religion that regularly wins Pulitzer Prizes. I mean, mm-hmm. top-notch journalism all the way. Yeah. They and, do great journalism and kill children. And kill children. Well, the... the 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 The, <laughs> the monitor does. <laughs> <laughs> the monitor does the great journalism. Uh, Christian Science Monitor, the shortwave station, they would do... Uh, they would have an hour program, and it would be 98 minutes of the best journalism you were going to find on shortwave radio. And then they would have readings of Mary Baker Eddy at the end. It was like 98, it was, it was 58 minutes of the best journalism you can get, and then two minutes of pure, unadulterated, batshit, nuts, <laughs> crazy transmitter off. I mean, it was, and that's, that's really how it was. Um, I, I don't, meet Christian scientists anymore. I used to see them all the time. I, they've got their church. I've never seen the building in use. Uh, Washington and Oregon have both repealed their religious shield laws recently. Yeah. Well, Washington's in the process of doing it. Oregon completed right. it. We're trying in Idaho, and those all got put in place because of the Christian scientists. They had paid lobbyists in every state government. They're apparently not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, we've got churches left and right in decline. Mega churches that aren't so mega anymore. Uh, small little country churches that are don't have the money to keep the lights on. And even the growing churches are scared that... And, and like, with the Adventists, I, I'm sure it's the same with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, where the big concern comes in isn't about the number of people coming in. Well, it's the fact that half of the people you bring in an evangelistic effort don't stick around for more than a few months 
Right. And well over half of your children leave by the time they're done with college. Uh, the I've heard numbers multiple times. Half leaving by the end of high school. Half leaving by the end of college. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. Okay. I mean, I did a, a talk in Phoenix uh, when I was on tour in 2013 about um, the rise of the nuns. I really want to talk about the nuns, and, and they said, and I said, they said, would you be willing to do a talk in Phoenix at, before you do the show? I'm like, yeah. Can you do it about the rise of the nuns? Like, wait, you're giving me a topic? Yes. Okay, fine. So I did it. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing, is you have huge populations of people who are religious because their family is religious and because they're told to go to church, and then uh, there are major exit points in high school in and in college. You think that would be a great thing for atheists? It's not so much, because just mm. because they don't uh, specify a religion doesn't mean they they don't believe in woo. Uh, a lot of these people become spiritual but not religious types or you know the, the I mean astrology is as popular as it's ever been. Yeah. Uh it it I don't know. It, what what I would say is the the plus here it's organized religion that has the power to lobby governments. They are the ones that have the power to bring lawsuits. They can fight comprehensive sex education and have successfully done it in many states they can successfully fight teaching proper biological science you know theory of evolution uh they can fight to make sure that parents can get a pass if they're praying for their kid and don't take their child to the doctor the people who have no religious affiliation the nuns they aren't likely to be backing those things. They aren't likely to be making those fights. Yeah. They may not be as good as atheists. That might not. Let me rephrase that. They might not be as much of what we want as everybody to be atheists. They're pretty damn good. All right. I don't even know if our end goal is to have the atheist number. I see all of this as progress. I have a lot of friends in my personal circles that get wound up about this and and we've all seen it the religious freedom acts state by state right i see that as progress i see that as a win for us this these are the vested these are the dying embers these are the last gas uh, this is the for the sport fans listening this is the 60 yard throw it in the end zone pass the hail mary the hail mary pass from the religious the i believe and i could be wrong you guys jump me if you need gang initiation style if we need to but these these are the last vestiges of you know we're we're grasping onto anything that we can i am encouraged by this i don't care about self identification of atheism or even so much as the nuns I think all of these things comprehensively pull back micro macro perspective. All of this is showing that the right side is winning in the end. Mm -hmm. This this is this is one more indication, like you're saying, a growing church, anecdotally, uh, qualitative versus quantitative. This is more qualitative data that we are the right side is finally winning, mm -hmm. little by little. Uh, so, listeners, that this is encouraging. <laughs> this is freaking encouraging for us. I, yeah. I would yeah. not disagree with that in any way. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. And I think when you look at the, the age demographics of belief versus non-belief, uh, it multiplies that by a huge factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the uh, 20 to 35 year old age group and and compare how many of those are nuns or atheists or agnostics compared to say your uh 50 to 65 age group and you realize that the direction things are moving uh it even amplifies that yes i think what we are seeing here is the dying uh gasps of the church trying to maintain some relevance in a world that, that they've lost their relevance in. Mm -hmm. That gap gets even worse when you compare the 80-year-old Fox watchers to, you know, the, the young people. Right. Caveat, as an ex-military guy who, within the past two and a half years, has left Alabama, that 80-year-old demographic is still well within its Gen X 
sometimes Gen Y. So listeners of Atheist Nomads, I know some of you may come from the Pacific Northwest region. Your perception of reality is skewed. <laughs> yeah. do, do a diagonal across America, and it's the complete inverse, I have, unfortunately. I have often described Washington west of the Cascades as Middle Earth. This is a mag- <laughs> uh, To quote Bill Hicks, this is a magical land of fairies and elves. Mm-hmm. Do not leave. Well, okay, if you're, if you're in uh, the, the liberal western edge of the Northwest, make a trip to Walla Walla. Yeah, Ooh, of course, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, or to Burns. The, to the dry side of the state. Or come to Idaho. <laughs> Not Boise. Boise is a nice little liberal haven. Lewiston is a nice little liberal... Not not Lewiston. Uh, Moscow Pullman are a nice little liberal haven in uh, the, the otherwise insanity of the, the inland Northwest. How's CDA? Taken over by California conservatives. Oh, that's a shame. And if your name is yeah. Sandy Pants, you should you know, skip California and just come up here. Totally agree. <laughs> so I shouldn't go check on my house in a mountain home is what you're saying then, Dustin, right? <laughs> I don't like making those <laughs> house uh, checks. Mountain home? I, I, I don't go. It's not that far. I just drive by on the freeway. <laughs> right. It's it's this little shitty little town with an Air Force base. Mm-hmm. That There's no draw for me there. <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> but if you want to check out on your, your house there, uh, just make sure you, you actually stay in Boise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where the bars are. Yes. <laughs> the the good, not so rapey ones. <laughs> right. Okay, also stay out of Garden City. Uh, they, they get a little rapier there. Yeah. Uh, you do kind of a pretty mouth there, Paul. <laughs> you, get, you guys just lost 40% of your Idaho listenership <laughs> right there. <laughs> hey, you got a pretty mouth. <laughs> uh, actually... As an Idahoan, uh, I doubt it. We all make fun of Garden Shitty. And uh, <laughs> the only people who even remotely like going to Mountain Home live in Mountain Home. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it's kind of like the Kent or the Fife of Washington. <laughs> wow. That is really unfair to oh, Kent. Wow. <laughs> Fife is fine. Totally unfair to Kent. <laughs> oh, Wow. And now we have a story from The Raw Story. Yeah, a Texas woman explained her unusual mugshot where she is, you know, smiling this cute little, awesome, happy little home kind of smile. She's kind of hot. She kind of is. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, I'd like to see her in yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, she actually burned down a yoga studio. <laughs> Wait, wow. this was a yoga studio? It was. And apparently she thinks that it is, quote, a devil's temple. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of people have seen this get passed around Facebook a, a bit. But uh, yeah, she's been on the on the the making the Facebook rounds a bit. Uh, apparently, yeah, she there was no injuries. She she tried to torch the building late at night. So, you know, thankfully, nobody was hurt. But uh thousands of dollars worth of damage and all this and uh and if you just took it on that you you might think that you know she was just like a kind of crazy christian but yeah there's a lot more to this woman here (laughs) i think the story was actually that she was sexually harassed by people at the yoga clinic the the owners yeah the owners of the yoga clinic so it actually was a retaliation for uh sexual harassment rather than uh not believing in yoga or believing yoga was sin when i first read the headline my thought on it was she burned it down because yoga is sin and all of this but that that really wasn't uh, my take from it was it was retaliation to the uh, sexual uh, harassment that she was undergoing it it seems to have been a, a A combination. She was upset about the the sexual harassment, and so that made her angry. She was a crazy Christian who thought it was a devil studio, hence why these people were harassing her, and then she tried to burn it down. Uh, There's definitely some more to that, though. Um, Yeah, so this lady, Nancy Duarte, um, she believes that she was also being uh, under the protective service of the Secret Service. And that um, four of her best friends had been murdered uh, months before. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot. She claiming that four of her friends had been murdered or were four of her friends actually murdered? She was claim- claiming this. Okay. And she, she had so had- they possibly could still be alive. Uh, 
<laughs> if she even I'm had sure friends. Never have had four friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, she she throughout the the day the weekend she had been giving interviews to different studios, different TV newspapers, and all that. And apparently, all of her stories were all different. Uh, yeah, this woman has some fucking issues. She actually w- said that she was involved with shooting three rounds into the studio's front window, but she didn't do the shooting that happened about a month ago. Okay. So, yeah, this woman's got some fucking issues. I don't even I I'm I don't I don't know if she's just kind of has some chemical imbalance and she's just fucking batshit. I don't know if she even got harassed or if she even really went to that studio. Of course she's got issues, dude. Have you ever seen women in yoga pants? I would never attack a yoga studio. Ever. <laughs> ever. Well, watch me. My apologies to the feminists in the audience. As fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, I recall from, from my time in the Adventist church that yoga was viewed as evil. It was... Satan's work to get into you through you being flexible or something, or I guess in the aligning of your chi, it would welcome in. It's the cheeks. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Are you talking about gerbils here? What? <laughs> cheeks. So I guess- I'm just gonna make a fisting motion here. I don't know what he's doing here, but uh, do you, uh, if you're into like weird YouTube videos, uh, the actress who was in Northern Exposure, uh, the the. The pilot. You talking about her? Was she a pilot? I don't know. The, 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 really, the really short watched. brown hair yeah. and the mole. Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, she's crazy religious now. She did a video called Christ Toga. Yoga for Christians. Well, not yoga because yoga is sinful. It was uh, flexing about for Jesus. It, I, I would watch it that. It's on YouTube. It's I awesome. Would. There's also the Christian pole dancing class. Really? What? Oh, yes. What? Christian pole dancing Those class. Those are popular. <laughs> Teaching women how to, you know impress the guy you know because it's all about him right I'm- yeah yeah to be sexual for her husband oh so it's not like a christian brotherhood be sexual for jesus kind of thing it's it's for your husband well if jesus is putting <laughs> dollars into your g-string <laughs> <laughs> now i feel like i'm covered in a thin film <laughs> well it is hot in here so uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the problem with studios <laughs> <laughs> studios with Five, Five people. Guys. Five people in it, yeah. Not a sausage, sausage party. Fest, not Penis. A Penis. <laughs> Penis. Paul, I am Paul. cut that out. Paul. So I just want to say, now that we're wrapping up the show, that I said panspermia and nobody jumped on it. Congratulations. Crazy. I think you all get an Crazy. award. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, where I come from, I'd have had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I from no child's left behind state of Texas. <laughs> we started that shit. <laughs> All right, we are running out of. Well, let me start that over. We are out of time, <laughs> so we're gonna have to make the rounds one last time. Uh, plug all the shit you got to plug, uh, Sam. Well, I do a show called Ask an Atheist. It is a podcast, but also a radio show, mostly a radio show. Uh, so you won't have all of the, the, the fun language on my show, <laughs> uh, you can go to askanatheist.tv or tune in Sundays at 3 p.m. on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. And it actually escapes me when we're on the air in Michigan, so you'd have to check their station. Uh, I'm also a president of Humanists of Washington. I should probably also say that. Uh, it's a humanist organization for the state of Washington, one of the oldest secular groups in Washington state. Uh, also just recently got a job with Foundation Beyond Belief. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, an actual charitable organization for, uh, secularists and humanists. Uh, it's not just, it's, you know, I mean, not what it is, it's, it's doing charity in the cause of atheists. When people say, hey, there was a disaster or something and, uh, and you get those weird Christian people are saying, we're, we're, we're the atheists, we're the humanists. Well, point at us. Because that's what that's what we do now, and I am really happy to be there. Hey, you're so fucking official. You got a badass phone number. <laughs> yes, eight four four skeptic eight four four seven five three. Blah blah blah. <laughs> All right, fuck, fuck. Rich. I'd like to say, you know, we are, uh, my wife and I do, uh, or have done and may continue to do Living After Faith podcast, but I want to kind of give a, a shout out to our parent organization, which is Recovering From Religion. They've got a new project that they've started that is uh, really tearing things up. It is called uh, 
the hotline project. And basically what it is is a hotline for people who are experiencing religious trauma or are in a place where they have doubts. And the number is great. I love it. It's one eight four. I doubt it. And <laughs> they have trained professionals who, who are trained to uh, ask the right questions and help people work through the process. And uh, I think this is a it's a recovery based, obviously, and the idea is to help people who are struggling because getting out of religion is a very difficult thing. Anyone who's worked with that. So uh, we are the podcast for recovering from religion, but you can look up, look them up at recovering from religion. Just Google it. And uh, if you're dealing with the recovery aspect of religion. Uh, I just want to kind of steer you that direction and say there are a lot of great resources. They can help you find a secular therapist. They can, I mean, just all the way down, give you some great advice. So uh, uh, our podcast is out there, livingafterfaith.com. Uh, but if you're, you know, really in that place where you're hurting, that's a place that uh, I'd like to steer you to. All right. And Paul. Well, thank you again, guys, for making uh, another appearance. I have two appearances and a parental warning dedicated to just me. I am very special. Elite company in the atheist uh, nomadic audience. Penis. Penis. You can find, <laughs> it, it, hey, listeners, if you are bored with just the constant baby Jesus talk and you need a little bit of Momo up in your uh, no sunshine area, you need to come to www.coronifyme.com. That's Q-U-R-A-N-I-F-Y-M-E coronifyme.com iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher get yourself a little bit of Big Al and Momo love man, I hit you mm, right up hey, hey, and Wesley Wesley has made appearances on Coronify Me so if you're a big fan of his sultry mm, sultry tones yeah baby yeah, right, I was like the that. not so gay guy on one of his shows yeah, only because we didn't get the gay guy version of you I'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to get Dustin but fear not atheist nomads Dustin will be making an appearance just as soon as I drink enough beer to write another script thank you again guys for this opportunity I appreciate it in the shows to come we'll be on the imaginary friend show hooray yeah. Jake Farr Wharton and I will also be have already been on this yes. week's Ask an Atheist. It will what's, be downloadable. So uh, yes, yeah, just hit the website. <laughs> what, what's amazing here is after three years of not being on another podcast, I get on three in one week. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck is with that? You got to get out more often. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I whore myself at every chance I get. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you all very much for, for listening. Thank all of you here in the studio with me. That is awesome to be able to say for uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Sam, for the use of your studio and equipment here. Before I let you go, I've got a little bit of feedback I need to share. Paul kind of raked us over the coals for how apologetic we are about asking for money. Uh, you know, we, we prided ourselves on, on being self-funded uh you know i was i was footing all the bills myself for for the first quite a bit until i was i was unemployed and then finally had to ask for money and since then yeah it's been kind of tough to do uh we put a lot of work into the show we've we've invested the money we'd gotten until quite recently into getting new hardware and we've got the hardware there but we put a lot of time into this that's time taken away from our, our friends and family uh, times that we aren't doing other things and you invest a lot of time into listening to us. Go to patreon.com slash atheist nomads and give us money. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.